of time here to win this stage because if he wins with a big margin he will take over the yellow jersey and that will be something of a surprise well a brave man to go out on roads like these because they're very long and very straight and the wind is up as well because that's going to be difficult for him over the final kilometers so the field is all together but this first week of the tour highlighted by crashes so let's go to gary imlach now who can sum up just what a tough week it's been in this first week of the tour de france over to you gary Last year it was the roundabouts of Holland, this year it's the narrow roads of northern France, but whatever the scenery of the accident, the first week of the tour always seems to be a week of crash. Well, there is a big pile-up. People are just going berserk. Looks like a Seiko ride has gone down. We're battle of survival. Rides have gone off to the right into the ditch here. It's crazy, isn't it? The first week of the tour is always jittery, with a full complement of riders and not enough miles in their legs to calm them down and string them out. The consensus in the peloton seems to be that this year things are worse. There's many factors, the roads, the speed, 200 guys and all those things. I think there's too many people on too small a roads and, you know, and everyone's really nervous. You survive the first week without crashing, the second week you're going to be okay. In fact it's a clear sign that the situation's getting out of hand when non-climbers are looking forward to the Pyrenees. Last year was the same thing I remember, just very nerve-wracking. I mean, when, when you got, finally got to the mountains, it was a relief to get to the mountains because then finally you're able to just be in your little group and, and ride, you know, for me, riding alone, but with other guys riding with a smaller group. For some reason, the whole season so far seems to have had more than its quota of crashes. In Milan San Remo, Laurent Jalabert brought down Britain's Max Chiantri in the final sprint, and Abraham Alano's attempt to warm up for the tour with a win in the Dauphiné Libre ended up down the side of a hill. The Tour of Italy in particular had enough crashes for a compilation video. The most embarrassing being Alexander Schaefer headbutting a snack bar on a less than tight bend, and the nastiest looking Luc LeBlanc hitting the wall. The unluckiest rider in the race though had to be Marco Pantani. Having missed most of last year after an encounter with a car, he was brought down by a black cat, and like LeBlanc he had to abandon. Of course, the history of the Tour is littered with crashes and quite a few of them have decided the outcome of the race. In 1951, Wim van Es, the first Dutchman to wear the yellow jersey, became the first to lose it when he went down a ravine on the Col d'Obisque. It was bad news for his team too, because their entire supply of spare inner tubes was tied together to pull him up, forcing them to abandon as well. In 1971, Louis Ocaña was leading the race when he missed a bend, hit a spectator and broke his collarbone, effectively handing Eddie Merckx the third of his five tours. More recently, of course, Rolf Sorensen crashed out in yellow during the 91 tour and Chris Boardman famously lost the chance to take it when he lost control in the rain at Saint-Brieuc during the 1995 prologue. For drama, you can choose from crashes at either end of tours in the 90s. Orange Jalabert's in 94, when a policeman officially didn't step out in front of the peloton, at least according to the police, on stage one. And Jamaluddin Abdujafarov's spectacular collision with a coke bollard within 50 yards of the finish on the Champs-Élysées three years earlier. For sheer courage, though, nothing matches Bernard Eno's refusal to give up the yellow jersey in 1985. Despite breaking his nose in a nasty fall close to the finish in Saint Etienne, he finished the stage and went on to win the last of his five tours. And all of those riders did recover from those horrific injuries. Well, this is the sprint now at Nervi Saint Sepulchre, 245 kilometres covered. Seven minutes ahead is Vasseur, but this is the sprint for second place. The battle for that green and yellow jersey goes on. Zabel just about nipping that one off Cipollini. But Paul Vasseur, who broke away at around 114 kilometres, he had a lead of nearly 18 minutes. He's still over seven minutes clear. Well, it's a bit crazy, these two riders sprinting for bonuses of around about two seconds, because at the moment they should get their teams together and organise the chase behind. They're fighting out, really, as if this is the win at the end of the stage, because they're so close, pushing themselves a long way ahead. It just goes to Zabel on the line, and Chipper will take third place. Well, the race has gone on because the GAN rider, Cedric Vasseur, whose father, by the way, Alan Vasseur, had a breakaway similar to this back in 1970, I think it was, Paul, and he won the stage. His father was a great rider when it came to those lone breakaways, in fact, winning a stage of the Tour de France. But if Cedric Vasseur can keep the time gap that he's got at the moment, 6 minutes and 25, he will have something that his father never had, and that's a yellow jersey in the Tour de France.
Right, well, at the moment, Vasseur started the day 21st overall, at 1 minute and 37 seconds behind Mario Cipollini. And I don't think Cipollini expected to lose the lead today. But right now, I don't think equally so that Vasseur expected to get the lead, but it's beginning to look possible. Yes, he is showing signs of fatigue, and you know, if he survives all the way to the line, he'll have been alone in the lead for 147 kilometres. And this is not a flat route today, it rolls all the way. You can see now he knows that he's got the stage victory. He wants now to try and conserve as much of that time as possible, forcing himself to keep going. This is the time when he will get some energy from somewhere else, some energy just from his courage and determination just to keep those legs going around. But a brilliant move by this man, and I think he's going to be so happy when he sees that line finally because he's been waiting for it for around about three and a half hours. So, a very interesting tour in this opening week, and now it looks as though he's going to get it. He knows it. He's going to spend a little time throwing kisses around here as Cedric Vasseur is going to become the surprised leader of the Tour de France he's still approximately two and a half minutes to the good at the last time check there's a chance to see what happens on television back in northern France that's dad Alain who used to race on the big team and he's commentating actually on his son crossing the line live Cedric Vasseur becomes the new leader of the Tour de France because here is the race for second place the Australian steward O'Grady is going to make it a one-two for Gann and look at the gap, 2.32, so Vasseur is confirmed as the leader. And Cabello of the Kelme team was third, but that was a superb result. And cleaning up for the rest, the two big sprinters, Cipollini and Zabel, but it won't matter now. Three minutes and 24 seconds back. Well, a brilliant day for Cedric Vasseur, one that will go down in the history books, but now he has a yellow jersey to contend with, and I'm sure they will make him rise to the occasion. He celebrates the crowds here. He knows that that is a great victory for himself and also for the Gann team. It's their second yellow jersey in the tour after that of Christopher Borman and Cipollini, the big loser at 2.17, Eric Zabel at 2.19, and Borman, his own teammate, back in fourth place. Jan Ulrich, though, Phil, all of the time well up there in fifth. And on the day that Alex Zulla didn't start, only 192 riders left in the race. Hello and welcome to the seventh day of the Tour de France. Well, yesterday we concentrated on the battle between the sprinters and instead it was a young Frenchman, Cédric Vasseur, who broke clear, won the stage and took the race lead. What went wrong among the sprinters? How did Vasseur escape? Well, before we join the action, here's Paul Schoen with his opinion. Cedric Vasseur got clear of the pack yesterday for one simple reason. They let him. It was a good solution for everyone. He would take the big time bonuses along the way. As he built up a lead that exceeded 17 minutes, an interesting game of chess was being played out behind. The lone leader would take the pressure off the battle between Mario Cipollini and Eric Zabel for the yellow jersey. I think that Mario Cipollini's psycho team had lost a little confidence in him. He was being repeatedly beaten in the sprints by Zabel, so they were happy to let the breakaway succeed and take the time bonus sprints. On the other hand, if Telecom wanted to have Zabel in yellow, then they would have to chase. Bjarne Ries, the team leader, decided he didn't want to have a short-term yellow jersey and ordered Telecom not to work. The result? Nobody chased and Vasseur gave the French a victory and a yellow jersey. The big losers on the day, Mario Cipollini and Eric Zabel. No more yellow dreams for them. And for the moment, not for Bjorn Aris, last year's tour winner either. He's still looking for three minutes and 59 seconds, although I don't think, Paul, he'll be too concerned about the whereabouts of Cedric Vasseur. He might be a little bit more concerned about the place of Jan Ulrich, fifth overall at the moment, 2.56 down on the Frenchman, and probably his most serious contender. Ulrich were in the championship of Germany, the jersey he won just before this tour started. Here's Abraham Alano, another one of the pre-race favourites. Hasn't shown a lot yet, waiting for the mountains, I think. He's just over three minutes off the pace. The field now heading down to the beautiful west coast of France, uh, heading to Marin. 217 kilometres today. The winds are blowing again, Paul, and they have caused one or two problems. Here's Eros Poli setting the pace but a big change in the tactics of the race because now it's the GAN team in the white jerseys who have to do all of the work at the front. Two-pronged attack for them, really, because they want to keep the yellow jersey on the shoulders of Cedric Vasseur, and if it does come down to a sprint at the finish, then there's a chance for Frederic Moncassin to take the stage. Well, even I could have kept up with the first two hours of the pace today. 30 kilometres an hour, Paul, that's around about 19 miles an hour. So I think uh, they switched off a little bit now because the sprinters have lost their grip on this tour. And now other riders are going to think how they can plan. And what a list now. Here is yet another crash on the road. Riders have gone into the ditch left and right of the road and completely come to a stop. 
But Phil, I've never seen so many crashes in the Tour de France, and I'm sure it's the fact that riders are taking risks to ride in the first 20 or 30 positions, and all of the time, people going down. In fact, Cipollini's one of the men involved. Mario Cipollini now in red is down as well and not looking too contented at all now. So Cipollini caught this time and a lot of riders taking a little while to get away here. At least Cipollini's got a couple of teammates back there. But well, one of them is Massimiliano Lelli and the other one's Paolo Fornacciari. They're going to wait for Cipollini and try and get him back into the main field. Lelli, by the way, the winner of recently of the US Pro Championships in Philadelphia. And won't be too happy with the speed. Cipollini's getting himself ready for departure here because it's going to be a tough chase down now, but he's away. There's the long, empty road ahead. A lot of team cars have already gone forward here. Cipollini's in Paul looks as though he's not too happy with the way he's riding. He looks in a little bit of pain. He doesn't look fluid. He hasn't got himself going quickly, and they'll have a hard time getting back into the main field because the main field riding this quickly doesn't wait for anyone. Well, now we've got up to the main field, and this is the sprint for the finish here in Maren. And looking over his shoulder, there's a Rabobank rider. I think it's Rolf Sorensen looking probably to see where Robbie McEwen is. There's an awful lot of movement in this bunch here. They're all over the road. But leading out now, we've got Laurent Gentil of the Big Mat team. Zorbel is on his wheel here. Abdou Japarov is trying to get on terms. Cipollini's got back to this group, but he's not in the hunt, really. He's over to the left at the moment. Abdou Japarov going forward now, and it looks as though it's going to be Eric Zorbel who'll get it. And I think Tom Steele has just hurled his water bottle at somebody in the centre of the pack. But as they come clear to the line, Zorbel gets the victory. Second will be Jerome Blylevens, I think, and Abdou Japarov third. Let's have a look at the order over the line again. Zabel notching his 15th win of the season here as Blylevens comes clear for second. Now the judges have disqualified Zabel and also Tom Steeles. Tom Steeles from the race itself, Zabel from the win. So let's join Paul Sherwin to take us through what was a very dodgy finish indeed. This is how the judges saw the finish, to begin with a fairly normal sprint. But then Rolf Sorensen in the orange jersey for Rabobank leaps across at 35 miles an hour to the opposite side of the road. First incident on the right-hand side, the green jersey of Zabel and Cipollini come together, bouncing off each other. The judges would let that one go, that wasn't too serious. But then Eric Zabel feels somebody moving by him on the left. He leaps across to that wheel because he knows that's the one he wants. But this is the incident they didn't like. He butts into the rider with his head there and they decided that was dangerous riding and they relegated him to last position in the pack. First man over the line, last in the pack and the victory was given to your own Blylevens. However, on the other side of the pack, something else was going on. Tom Steele's the Belgian champion, fighting it out with Frederick Moncassin in the white. Now, these two riders want to get into the slipstream of Mario Cipollini. They're bumping against each other consistently. Nobody wants to give up, but in fact, it's Steele's who manages to go round, even though Gan rider Moncassin nearly falls off. Steele's has lost his impetus and also his stability. He falls onto the shoulder there of Travisoni, but he's lost all chance of a win. He gets mad, he takes out his bid on at 40 miles an hour and hurls it at the Frenchman. That's what the judges didn't like. They said it was aggression against another competitor and they threw him straight away out of the race. And the sensations don't stop there as we now tune up for stage seven. Moren to Bordeaux, the field that being flagged away with Cedric Vasseur in the Mayo Jaune, but not coming out to the race start this morning was Evgeny Berzin, the Russian rider. Although he got to the finish yesterday, realized he had broken his collarbone. Out too with a damaged neck is the man who won the Tour of Italy, Ivan Gotti, another non-starter. While Mario Cipollini, we saw him crash, well, an injured knee, he too has abandoned the Tour de France today. Three big names have gone from this tour. There's another one as well, Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov, who was said to have given a positive drugs test earlier in the stage of this race, has been disqualified, so he's gone home. As always, Phil coming into the final few kilometres, Team Telecom at the front trying to set it up for their sprinter, Eric Zabel. And this time, again, it's the turn of Jan Ulrich in the white jersey as the champion of Germany. Well, there's no doubt, Paul, that Zabel is very upset about the decision to relegate him last night from that victory. He felt he'd done nothing wrong. The judges saw otherwise. This group has again been split by a crash. Jens Hepner was the faller. But now we're looking at about 64 riders lining up for the finish here. And you're right, Ulrich is working well here, looking for Zabel. A lot of teams trying to get their sprinters up there too. A former winner here in Bordeaux as well, Frederic Moncassin. Abdou Japarov won here in 1994, but unfortunately, he's been sent home early. 
You're absolutely right as we go under the banner there. And this is a superb finish here. The whole of Bordeaux, I think, has turned out to watch the riders come in down the side of the River Gironde. And now the sprints are starting for the line here. La Française at Jeu. He's trying to break it up a little bit, but they've marked him well. Bjorn Arise himself has got control at the front now. He's looking better every day of this tour. As Rees is thinking of Zabel, there he is, lying four men down the line. Easy to pick out in that green jersey. Zabel wants this for very special reasons now. He's not worried about anything else. The win he wants to make sure the judges get it right. Well, the team have put him in a great position. There's Frankie Andreu trying to get a place for himself for the coffee and his team as well. But Zabel's right in the slipstream, but it looks now as if he's been boxed in. He's in second. So Zabel in second, but he's got a lovely smooth lead out for the line. Look at his face now as Zabel kicks with all his weight there. Monkasan, long way back. Blylevens is behind too. This isn't going to be. That's Kersey Poo trying to challenge young Kersey Poo, but Zabel gets revenge. He gets the victory in Bordeaux, as in fact he did back in 1995. But this one was rather special for him. So Eric Zabel gets the victory as we see it here. Jan Kersipu makes an appearance at last, the sprinter on the Casino team. And Jerome Blylevens again, not quite having the strength necessary to get the kick that turns third place into a win. And Robbie McEwen, he's the Australian rider in his first tour. He crosses the line in fourth place. But that was the important one today for him. Eric Zabel getting the win he wanted. The overall situation after seven stages in the prologue. Cedric Vasseur leads by a minute and 49 seconds. Eric Zabel, he keeps nibbling off with the time bonuses. Chris Borman up there in third place. On to stage eight now, a so turn to Poe, the gateway to the Pyrenees at just 100 miles, 161 and a half kilometers, 186 riders are left in. Certainly through some of the most beautiful wine country of the world, the French Bordeaux region and this area they're leaving from Sautern makes a very clear white sweet wine. If you've got a chance to take some dessert, well, I think you should try it. That's allowed, but some things aren't. The current drug of choice in cycling is EPO. In simple terms, EPO is a drug that mimics the effects of altitude training by raising the number of red cells in the blood. And there's the problem, because medically it's impossible to tell the difference between a cyclist who's been up a mountain and one who's been down the chemist. So although dope tests carried out daily at the stage finish are fine for detecting the usual scientific suspects, they're no good for EPO. And here's where things get interesting, because the riders themselves were so concerned about EPO that they gave their support to a creative compromise. This season, in addition to drug testing, cycling's ruling body, the UCI, has also introduced what it calls health testing. And any rider with a red blood cell count over 50% is prevented from competing for his own welfare. Not banned, just sent away until his blood is back to what the UCI considers normal and healthy. They take a little blood, a little blood sample and uh, they measure it and uh, if you're over 50 then you, uh, you have two weeks to, to lower it again. So I think it's a, it's a good measure. All the riders are, are together in the fact that they want this to be a healthy sport and they, want, you know, they know that they're, they have lives after cycling. So everybody wants to make sure that uh, we are, we're healthy professionals. So far this season, 10 riders have been sent home for the good of their health, including former King of the Mountains, Claudio Chiapucci. In the first week of the tour, though, four teams have been tested all below the limit. But the system isn't without its critics. Some riders think the ceiling has been set too low, particularly for riders like Colombia's Chepi Gonzalez, who live at altitude. No solamente nosotros, sino habrá muchos más que manejarán eh, pues niveles altos de matoprito, ¿no? Entonces la UCI tendrá que hacer un estudio muy concreto a, a los corredores colombianos. But 50 is low, but for people who are living on sea level, I think uh, there are little problems. And I, in my career, I've seen no rider with a level of over 50 during competition. The other criticism is that with this new blame-free approach, the UCI is ducking the moral issue by not even trying to distinguish between the dopers and the naturally high. Not to make light of the whole issue, but you know, there is a controlled substance on public sale at the stage start every morning. Four strong cups of coffee will put you over the UCI limit. Although, as with all drugs, there are well-documented side effects. And now back to the action here, and the riders concentrating on the finish in Poe after that 100 miles. And so far, the race has been pretty nippy. The first hour they covered, Paul, nearly 49 kilometres today. 
And despite several attempts at breakaways, it's all come back together for the final sprint. And again, Phil, it's Jan Ulrich on the front with one kilometre remaining, trying to set it up for Eric Zabel one more time. Well, this is the last day before the mountains begin, and after that, we're going to find this, I think, to be one of the hardest tours in modern times. So this is the last day for the sprinters, and they've fought hard to keep this race together. Zabel has got two wins under his belt. He's right in the hunt again, and once more, Jan Ulrich, he seems to be a tower of strength this year, swinging off as Bjarne Rees takes them around the corner. It's amazing to see the amount of work that Bjarne Rees has done in this first week of the Tour de France because tomorrow he's going to have to turn around and reinstall himself as the leader of the pack. Absolutely right, but now they're thinking only the sprint of 400 metres to go and the Telecom boys are again catapulting Eric Zabel towards the line, but watch out because Nicola Minali is mixing in and again Jerome Blyleven still looking for a real win because he's only got one by disqualification. But now Zabel goes for the line and doesn't seem anybody to stop him now. As Manali comes, Moncassan in the white and Bly Levens, but they're not going to get on terms. Eric Zabel, that is a win at number 16 this season for him. He's equaled Mario Cipollini as the two top winners so far of 1997. And that was a clean sprint for sure. Well, there was over 130 riders in this sprint. There was still a few off the back today, some 50 left behind. But there's how he does it. Kicks very strongly past his teammate here. Minali a little bit slow out of the blocks, I think, but then he came at him quite well. Moncasan also left far too far down the field, having to come over the top of Jerome Blylevens, and I'm not too sure he actually will get over the top of Blylevens. He won't. So for the second day in succession, Blylevens takes third place, and equally so, the win going to Eric Zabel. He'll tell you he's had four wins in the Tour this year, but of course, officially, it's only three. Close, but not quite as close as when Manali got the verdict by four millimetres over Moncassin, but still, it's a good job we have photo finish equipment on the Tour de France these years. Quite remarkable to see the power of this man, Eric Zabo. Once he sees the finishing line, he just opens it up, and I think he owes a very big thank you to Giovanni Lombardi, who they brought across to the team this year. He certainly has been able to set him up perfectly. Learned a lot of his skill on the track scene because he is Olympic champion at the points race, but really quite remarkable the way Eric Zabo seems to time it just right. Well, that's the ability of being a perfect sprinter, of course, and Zabel now 16 wins this season, beating Manali, Blylevens, Moncassan and Lori Ose of the casino team getting up there in fifth place in what is his first Tour de France. So, after nine days of cycling and no bigger hill than a fourth category, we are now about to cross into the giants of the Pyrenees, the bridge between France and Spain. The mountains are with us, the big names must fight. And it's a beautiful day here at the finish at Ludan Viel, but you know the weather here in the Pyrenees can change very quickly. However, we do expect Bjarne Ries to put in his challenge. At this stage last year, Ries was already the leader, and ahead of him in Denmark was the biggest welcome any sportsman had ever been given. Cycling has since become Denmark's number one sport, and thanks to Bjarne Ries, most of Denmark will be watching television today. You know, he's naturally a quiet man, and when Paul Sherwin spoke to him, he certainly wasn't giving much away about his plans or that of the team. <laughs> it's pretty normal. Are you happy with the way the team is? They, they are the best team in the Tour for the moment. Yeah, it's a good team. We win and we're satisfied. I was talking to one of your friends from Luxembourg yesterday and he said, your biggest adversary is going to be Bjarne Ries. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Well, perhaps he is feeling the pressure after all. Well, let's join the action now as we start the climb of the Col de Tourmalet. The two riders out in front here are Javier Pasquale from Kelme and Pascal Hervé from Festina. A little bit of mist and fog on the climb as we come up towards the summit and still these two riders are clear. Well, I think Pascal Hervé is trying to set the race up for his own teammate, Richard Viron, because these riders from Festina have always been aggressive in the mountains and Richard Viron has always been very successful in the Pyrenees. Well, Hervé, a good rider in his own right, but look at the conditions here now as they do come up over the top. It's Pasquale who goes over first. Hervé sits up there getting himself ready for the descent. Here comes Richard Viron, and he's actually climbing in a small group of riders here, including his teammate Laurent Dufault. So the third and fourth, Ulrich is here, and so too is Rhys. So the top four riders in the Tour de France last year are in this group just 20 seconds back. 
And Richard Verenck looking very comfortable, I'm sure, thinking about a victory later in the day. But one man thinking about survival is the yellow jersey, Cedric Vasseur, suffering on every climb of the day so far, Phil, but always fighting his way back. The courage, I think, of the yellow jersey pushing him along. Well, he was in trouble on the Col de Soulor as well, but he got back to the group and he's not too far away from them as he continues to climb up the Tourmalade. Out uh, of the, not out of the race, but out of the hunt for the yellow jersey now, Chris Boardman, who was third this morning. He's crashed on the descent of the Col de Soulor and he's actually in the autobus now with all the sprinters, so he's going to lose big time today. But Cedric Vasseur has to take a lot of risks to try and pull himself back into the lead and keep the yellow jersey. But one man missing from this year's Tour de France is Lance Armstrong, and he decided to come and see the race in the Pyrenees. So let's catch up with his news. Lance, in case you didn't know, was diagnosed with cancer last October, shortly after signing for the French Cofidis team. And although the cancer is now thankfully in remission, he hasn't yet been able to return to competition. You're still a member of the Cofidis team, got a contract with them. How do you see your future in racing? Good question. I, I don't know. I need to just wait and see. My doctors have told me to, to rest this year, and so whatever happens after this year, then, then it's going to happen. But I still consider myself a, a professional cyclist. And so too does this man, the leader of the King of the Mountains, Laurent Brochard, as we start now the final climb of Val Laurent before we go down to the finish at Ludon Vielle. Now, Brochard has had a